Good evening. Are you tired of paying high property taxes? That's been a common complaint from Nebraska taxpayers for years. But property taxes are the biggest source of funding for schools in the state. So how do you lower property taxes without hurting education? That's the topic we're going to explore in this NET News special, Nebraska Schools, A Taxing Dilemma. I'm your host, Fred Knapp. Joining us for this discussion are Senator Mike Glure, Chair of the Legislature's Revenue Committee, Senator Kate Sullivan, Chair of the Education Committee, Shadron Schools Superintendent Caroline Winchester, and Lincoln Schools Superintendent Steve Joel. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before you uh, get started, here's a little background. Nebraska spends more than $3 billion a year on schools to educate nearly 300,000 students. Most of that, about 54%, comes from property taxes. About 37% comes from state sales and income taxes, and the remaining 9% comes from the federal government and other sources. Senator Glur, you've traveled across the state. You've been neck deep in this subject for a while. What's your sense of what people are telling you? Is the system working for them or not? Well, I think there have been questions for a number of years about our overdependence on property tax for K through 12 education. The challenge for us most recently has been the increase in ag land values, mm -hmm. uh, driven certainly by the influx of a lot of dollars when we had high commodity prices. Uh, people all of a sudden were taking some of those excess dollars and investing them in land. Can't blame them for that, um, certainly if you're an ag producer in some way, shape or form. But with those increased prices, uh, a hot market, you ended up with a higher assessed value for those properties. That translated into higher property taxes, and so it took a problem that was already one that we were looking at and exacerbated that problem, and now it is. It's a big, hot topic, especially within the ag producers, although one of the things that we recognize is it's probably only a matter of time before that transfers over to the residential area also. Mm -hmm. And businesses as well. And corporate business, corporate tax also, yep. Right. And uh, the, uh, the offset for that uh, is uh, state funding. Senator Sullivan, the school aid formula is incredibly complicated, but in its simplest form, it's supposed to, if correct me if I'm wrong, calculate the school needs, uh, subtract the resources that are available locally from the property tax, and then compute how much aid is needed from the state. Is that the right basic approach? And if it is, why do people seem to be so unhappy with it? Well. Um Partly because, yes, it, first of all, Fred, uh, you explained it correctly, needs minus resources equals equalization aid. So that is sometimes what kind of gets in the way of uh, explaining the situation. But because of that, and because uh, of just what Senator Glor said, with the ag land prices going up, property taxes going up, that being the biggest resource for local school districts to access, they suddenly, in particularly the rural school districts, have a tremendous amount of resources there. Mm -hmm. So consequently, of our 245 school districts, um, about two-thirds of them are supporting their school districts solely on the property taxes that they receive because it has been an increasing resource. So that leaves that equalization aid going to a smaller pool of, of school districts. Right, okay. Now, Caroline Winchester, your district, Shadron, has some unique characteristics because it has a lot of land off the tax rolls with the state park and, and uh, uh, owned by the federal government. What effect has the current system had on Shadron Public Schools and would more state aid help? Oh, well definitely more state aid would help. Um, you're right, we have a lot of property that's non-taxed. Uh, between 40 and 50 percent of our property is non-taxed. What it equates to our property taxpayers is about 10 percent of our population pays 40 percent of our, our taxes. Uh, but what has happened to us over the past year since I've been there, uh, we lost uh, 1.6 million dollars in state aid all in one year and that was out of about a five million dollar state aid budget which is so you're talking almost a, around a third of our, our state aid was all. Uh, we had to close four rural schools. Uh, we had to riff 16 positions which is a tremendous economic effect on the community because it's not only those 16 positions, but economically it, it hurts 50 other positions are lost throughout, uh, throughout the county. 
Uh, we also have aging structures. Two of our buildings are 1930s, one uh, early 60s, the other late 60s. Aging infrastructure, roofs, HVAC issues, uh, floated a bond, failed tremendously. Uh, and the taxpayer said, it's not because we don't understand you have needs. We just can't afford to pay any more taxes. Mm -hmm. Property taxes. Yes. Yeah. So consequently, we, we have seen over the past since, since uh, 06, 07, and I use that day because that's when the rural schools were consolidated in, um, we have seen a decrease in state aid at, at the rate of a uh, percent and a quarter per year, whereas the rest of the state has seen an increase in state aid of 3% three, three over that same period. And it's not only state resources, but our federal resources have also declined as well. Now, Steve Joel, Lincoln is a very different situation uh, from Shadron. You've got a growing number of students, many from low-income or non-English speaking <coughs> families. How does the current school finance system work for your district? Well, we, we think it we think it works. You know, it, it as it's um, in its simplest terms, needs minus resources. You know, our needs continue to go up. We grow about a thousand students a year. Um, the needs of those students that are coming into our system continue to grow up as well too. Our valuation doesn't keep up with our student growth. We, we have about $4,800 per pupil in terms of valuation uh, below the average. So, you know, there's been times in the school funding formula where, you know, we've, we've had uh, uh, benefit in the last couple of years certainly represent that. But there's been, uh, there's been years, particularly when I first arrived in Lincoln, where, you know, we haven't. And so it's, um, I, I don't know, uh, I, I've been, uh, this is 32 or 33 years as superintendent in two states. I started in small rural schools. I can't remember a year where we haven't been concerned about taxes, uh, particularly taxes for schools. And um, uh, with great respect to Senator Glor and Senator Solomon, this is a tough, tough thing to solve. There really isn't an easy solution because in our state, we have high standards. We have college and career readiness for all children. We want 90% on-time graduation rate. And the cost of that is never going to go down. It's always going to creep up and, and, and go up considerably. But uh, I would just tell you that, you know, we, I, I think we, we, we benefit from the formula the way it's written today. Um, but we're one of the fastest growing districts in the state. Right. Well, so they're obviously winners and losers, and that changes over time depending on the economy. Two years ago, uh, there was a big study that recommended increased state aid to schools as a way to lower property taxes. That's been tried before. In 1990, the legislature voted to increase both sales and income taxes. Over the next two years, state aid to schools went up sharply. During the same two-year period, property taxes for schools actually declined, but then they resumed their upward climb and they've increased every year but one since then. So, uh, oh, and by the way, when, when in 1967, when the sales and income tax were instituted to replace state property taxes, uh, they went down for one year and then they started back up again. So, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, given that history, Caroline, uh, of, of state aid not heading off future property taxes in increases, is increased state aid really the solution for well, your district? Well, I think you have to look at it, and, and it is very cyclical. We have a particular crisis, like in uh, 1966, there was a constitutional crisis. And then in 1990, there was a Gould lawsuit, a pending lawsuit that created an atmosphere for, and something had to be done. Uh, and you're right, sales and income taxes were raised. Um, if you go back to both 90, 96, the commitment of the state was supposed to be at 40%, and then the, and with uh, Teosa, the commitment was supposed to be 45%. And what has also happened is that the, ta the commitment has eroded over, over time um, after the bills have passed uh, through, you know, like for instance, um, tax breaks or... Um, um, corporate tax or, breaks? Well, corporate, you know... Individual. Individual tax breaks, sales tax exemptions. exemptions. And so that has eroded uh, the the commitment over time and, and the thing that people need to understand, uh, if, if one group is given a break here, somebody else has got to got to make up the difference. Um, and so that I think is part of the issue is that the, the percentage has never been committed to, uh, I think even after Teosa. And it's one reason too that I know there was a bill to, to bring back um, a tax uh, 
monitoring committee that was in the original TIOSA bill and then it was dropped during the budget crisis um, and it only saved five thousand dollars I think to, to drop it but because because I think a good example is the the acute increase of ag land values has the formula somewhat out of kilter because it they went up so fast mm -hmm. and so ha, it, you know a possibility is if there's a committee that can kind of monitor some of these things maybe we can make some adjustments you know quicker and be a little you know than letting them get so far out of whack. Sometimes I think hindsight's 2020. Right, you know, yeah. Had we uh, foreseen what was going to happen with ag land values, perhaps limiting the evaluation increases before they started would have headed off some of this. Mm -hmm. Because, and but on the other hand, I think we clearly had sort of a perfect storm in terms of uh, what was happening during the Great Recession, and we really had to cut dramatically in all the ways that we could. It was my, is Senator yep. Glores in my first year in the legislature. And it could have really been serious for school districts had we not had those ARA funds and EduJob the, the funds. Federal, uh, from, uh, the federal stimulus funds. Federal stimulus funds. But uh, the other thing that happened is that then we put more and additional pressure on property taxpayers mm -hmm. because at the same time we saw those increasing ag land values. Right, and, and property taxes have the reputation at least of being the most stable source mm -hmm. in a recession. Predictable. Sale. Yeah, mm -hmm. whereas stale, sales and income are, go down. Um, Steve, the, uh, Lincoln already gets significant state aid as we talked about, um, and if the pool of funds available from that source were to increase considering that homeowners haven't experienced the big hit that ag producers have. Wouldn't it be fair to send all of the increased aid somewhere else? I mean, just to level things out? Well, I think, you know, the formula is constructed in a way that you, you get what you're eligible to get. So, you know, I mean, there are some states that have a recapture provision that in a year where, you know, you're able to attract more resources than what the formula would call for, that uh, those dollars, Kansas is one, where those dollars would then go to the, you know, to be redistributed. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, you, you know, I think whenever you do something like that or you think about doing something like that, you run the risk of um, it becoming disequalized. Mm -hmm. And that, that's going oh, to be the other issue. Adequacy and equalization are, 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 are you know, are two things that uh, typically get, get yeah. talked about an awful lot. When formulas get treat, tweaked with and creates uh, winners and losers or exacerbates winners and losers or changes who are the winners and the losers. And, you know, I, um, I, I get it. I mean, Senator Sullivan's right. That was a, that was a shock to the entire system, how, how assessed value skyrocketed in the ad <coughs> area. And, you know, everything I'm reading right now says that that's, that's abating <coughs> and we're starting to see farm prices right, going down. Right, but there's down. still a lag effect. There's still a lag. Farmers are still paying as and, if they're... And that's, it's during those times of transition as the formula is trying to catch up with that where I think... Um, again, looking out over three decades, that's when the greatest amount of tension occurs. So, you know, I, I think there'd be plenty of people that would say, you know, if we can attract X with a dollar five, we ought to have access to X with a dollar five. Um, but, you know, certainly there are states that would say maybe you don't need a dollar. You, you take a dollar five, you don't need a dollar five. And you help. Yeah. That's a dollar five per hundred dollars of assessed right. value yes. of the yeah. tax rate. Sorry. And I think you have to take into account the uniqueness of each school district uh, because yeah. people talk urban or rural or large or small. Well, you don't necessarily fit that mold. I mean, we're a rural district, but have needs much more similar to our urban counterparts yeah. than our particular neighbors around us. And that complicates trying to create a formula that's, that's equitable to everybody. Senator Glor, I know I don't know what the situation in your hometown of Grand Island is, but the state as a whole is looking at a revenue shortfall for the current year. I mean, for the coming year. Um, what's your sense of uh, the political climate uh, as far as any possibility of changing sales or income tax rates to to substitute for property? I don't, I don't think there is a lot of enthusiasm for increasing taxes to offset this. The challenge is. Can we come up with some dollars to make some difference? Um, and the, the devil is in the details. I think there's a political will. Certainly, I don't think there's a single senator who hasn't heard that this is a problem and a priority statewide. Um, and certainly, they talk to their superintendents, and their superintendents talk to them. Um, but that's going to be the challenge. It's, I think, important to point out right now that 
knowing that this is a challenge for us and it's only likely to get to uh, perhaps be worse before it starts getting better, Senator Sullivan and I sat down last spring and put together a joint committee made up of her education committee and my revenue committee to start looking at what some solutions might be. And this wasn't an issue of holding hearings across the state. We've already had plenty of hearings across the state from both of our committees. It was a matter of sitting down with these uh, joint committees. Uh, this is an unusual process, by the way. Committees usually don't meet jointly and see it if we can't come up with some potential solutions involving the dollars and cents of it. And I want to get to those in just a second. First, I want to remind people this is an NET News special, Nebraska Schools, A Taxing Dilemma. I'm Fred Knapp, and with me are Senator Mike Gluer from Grand Island, Chair of the Revenue Committee, Senator Kate Sullivan from Cedar Rapids, Chair of the Education Committee, Caroline Winchester, Superintendent of Shadron Public Schools, and Steve Joel, Superintendent of Lincoln Public Schools. Um, so on the, some of the proposed solutions, both uh, Senator Gluer, you and uh, the committee that uh, the Joint Committee with Senator Sullivan has talked about possibly freezing or limiting valuation increases as a way of limiting property tax increases, but couldn't districts, districts simply raise their levies in that case to make up for artificially low valuations? I would leave it to the superintendent to say yes or no to that, but uh, there are some districts that can do that. There are some that can't. Uh, I think if we're talking about trying to provide property tax relief that's uniform um, across the state, um, that may be one of the decisions that an individual district will make. But what we're looking at from a legislative standpoint are something that has a much broader effect and can be helpful to all districts across the state. Okay. Um, now, the, you've talked about how they would have to be coupled if there, if there were these uh, uh, increase limitations. They'd have to be coupled with spending limitations or levy limitations on the schools, right? And we've. I'll speak to my revenue committee and let Senator Sullivan speak to the educational part, uh, part of this. Uh, understand, and, and viewers need to understand, we may meet jointly, but ultimately any bills that come out of this will be referenced either to the revenue committee or the education committee, depending upon um, how they impact um, uh, the operations and our responsibilities within the individual committees. But we're looking at the issues on the revenue side of um, slowing down that rate of assessed value increase as one of the solutions. We're also taking a look at the current property tax credit fund. Mm -hmm. um, most Nebraskans unfortunately don't recognize the fact that the state already allocates towards property tax relief somewhere just over two hundred million dollars yeah, well, you take two hundred million dollars a year of sales and income taxes and you send it to the counties to offset property taxes and and it shows up in a line on the property yep. tax statement and nobody notices it. Yeah, it just doesn't get noticed. And, and given that, part of our discussion within our joint committee has been, well, if it's not recognized, perhaps those are dollars that would be available to redistribute someplace else. I don't think you're going to see that happen. There wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for moving money from one pocket into another pocket to try and address this challenge. But just having that discussion, I think, was beneficial. Uh, last year, we increased that amount from around 140 million a year, adding another 64 million a year. So now we're up, like I said, over 200 million dollars. And there's uh, celebration in the streets. Right? <laughs> and, and people are saying, "I didn't know. I'll go back and look at my tax statement and feel comfortable tonight." But therein lies the problem. Um, yeah. When you come up with money and provide it, and land values continue to go up, assessed values go up, property taxes go up, sometimes what's being done is overlooked. Um, and, and that's a, certainly a challenge and not one that lends itself to an easy solution. And Senator Sullivan, on the spending side, there are already limits on schools. I believe it's two and a half percent a year, but there are all sorts of exceptions for natural disasters and court settlements and uh, special retirement contributions. So really spending for schools on average has gone up, I believe, four percent mm -hmm. in recent years. If there are limits enacted, what assurance can taxpayers have that they'll actually have some teeth? One of the things that I think we value in this state with respect to education is local control. So uh, there's a part of me that always says to a taxpayer concerned about what's going on with their local school district, uh, I think there's a message that goes out to local school boards 
uh, to be more accountable and cognizant of what they're doing in terms of uh, crafting their budgets and how they're spending the dollars uh, that they have access to. Um, can we at the state do some things that make sure that that happens? Well, that's uh, again one of the things when we're talking about l making some uh, limits on budget ex exceptions. I kind of liken that to the sales tax exemptions. Most of those were put in for very good reasons uh, to, to help uh, school districts and to perhaps manage those dollars more efficiently, effectively. So if we're going to eliminate some of those, and I would not be party to overlooking those because I think we do need to overlook uh, to pay attention to those but again I think it falls on the local school district to be con cognizant of how they're spending those dollars right. now, that being said there are a couple dimensions in the formula where I think we could rein in to so that school districts don't have to use it as an excuse to say the state made us levy this amount. Mm -hmm. uh, right so, now there's a minimum levy requirement. Right. I'd like to ask the superintendents to jump in real quickly yeah. on, on, on that idea. Is, is, is doing away with that uh, going to make your job easier or oh, hard? <laughs> we're already at a dollar five. So you can't we, go we any can't higher. do anything. Um, and, and actually, if you look at the number of school districts that, that get on that bubble, you're not talking a whole lot of, lot of dollars um, with that. You know, you talked about restriction, restricting valuation. Uh, like I said, we're at a dollar five, but our neighbors are not. Uh, they'll simply raise levies if they don't have, a, have enough funds and, and it doesn't relate into true property tax relief. So. And we're, we're at the dollar five as well. And okay. you know, we, we do have, um, to Senator Sullivan's point, I mean, we do have people attend our budget hearings and, and ask us to consider property tax reductions. But again, when you're a growing district like we are, that um, it just doesn't have the ability to, to do that. Um, nor would we want to put ourselves in a position where if we were to cut our tax levy, how do we make that up in, in subs uh, subsequent years? So that's been a, you know, that's been a dilemma, I think, for our tax, some of our taxpayers that would say, you know, do you really need as much money as you're able to acquire this year? This is a good year for us because, you know, the, the formula recognized our growth, they recognized our, it recognized our needs, and we had the ability to add back some of those things that we had to take out um, right around 2010, 2011 to try to make our budgets meet. Mm. And school districts are really unique in the way they budget, but also the, the I think the legislator's fiscal office has recognized as well the struggles to keep under inflation on account of growing districts like Steve, they're adding schools, they're having to add staff, that's going to show their, you know, increases larger than inflation. And then in small rural school districts, they have a number of fixed costs that they can't get below and so that creates uh, an unusual situation or not maybe like the business world would experience. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, we've been discussing some of the practical changes and challenges to uh, fixing the situation uh, that might be coming up in the next legislative session, but now I'd like to ask each of you to take a sort of a long range view. If you could wave a magic wand and bring about long term structural changes in Nebraska schools and the way we pay for them, what would they be? Just, and, and include any closing thoughts you have in, in this uh, segment. Uh, we'll start with you, Senator Gore. Well, <clears throat> it's an interesting concept. I think I'd start with $8 corn prices, per bushel corn prices. I think it becomes a lot easier for any of us at the end of the month when we try and balance our checkbook if we've got a lot of money in the checking account. So it would sure be nice if we saw the economy pick up, whether it's um, commodity prices or whether it's overall em uh, employment and jobs in the state. Uh, that would help. Um, okay. And then we'd have more money to be able to distribute. I think the other thing that would be helpful, uh, and this really is in a wish list, is as they say, property taxes are uh, locally collected, locally assessed, locally controlled which means the state doesn't collect property taxes. Uh, the counties collect it and they distribute those monies based upon budgets put together by entities that have elected boards that we all vote on. And uh, for the general citizenry to understand that and to work with those individual boards, and there are hundreds of them. So show up at your local show school up board. And, and uh, I think Senator, uh, Senator uh, Superintendent Joel's the exception to the rule. Okay and maybe uh, Superintendent Winchester also. There's no doubt about it that the 
people of this state value education and they want quality education and they're willing to pay for it. But the reality in the current circumstance is that in many ways, in my estimation, the state has not risen to the level it should in terms of its support for public education. We are putting too much reliance on property taxes. So we need to do something about that, but it begs the question where the dollars come from. In addition to that, when you have 245 school districts, who uh, two-thirds of them support their school district solely on property tax revenues, it begs also the question, what is the state's role if we have a constitutional responsibility to provide that free education? So those are some of the issues that I think need to be corrected. All right, two minute drill. I would, yeah, I would concur with Senator Sullivan. I, I like to put it, we have too, uh, too few people paying for the privilege of public, or per, uh, participating in the privilege of paying for public education. We need to somehow uh, make, balance the three-legged stool, so to speak, a little bit uh, more evenly. But if I can just maybe change directions a little bit, I just want to share a, why it's important to fund public education. And, and, and that's a, a poem that was shared with me from an eighth grade ELL student. And they said, school is a gift for students. When they come, Every day, they get to unwrap it. Once it is out of the box, they have to choose how to use the gift. Some choose to even use it a little, some choose to use it a lot. There are even some that do not appreciate the present. They stuff it in their locker and walk away. What a waste of a free gift. <laughs> Steve, Joel? I don't, you know, wish list. Um, I, I would go back to, um, to something Senator Sullivan said, and I know Senator Glor knows. We're, we're an exemplary school system in the state. And now I'm not talking about Lincoln, I'm talking about our state school system. We are highly ranked in all measurables. Uh, you know, we're two, three, four, so it works here. Um, but it works because we've got that commitment from, from people who care deeply about education. You know, to me, um, again, looking back at a lot of years in this, you know, it's the third, third, and the third. I remember that discussion a lot. If it could be a third sales, a third income, a, th a third property tax, maybe it doesn't feel um, as painful uh, in, in that regard, but I know that's next to impossible to achieve. But it just seems that, again, I'll go back to what I said before, when we have a shock to the system like we have right now, and the residential shock is probably forthcoming, um, then you know it, it, the, the, the tension is definitely um, heightened. So there's, to me, there's no real answer. I'm just very grateful we have leaders and, and, uh, in our unicameral that are willing to have these open and honest conversations. Very good. All right, we'll have to end this conversation there for now, but I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it in the coming months ahead. This has been an NET News special, Nebraska Schools, A Taxing Dilemma. You can watch this program on the web at netnebraska.org. Thanks again to our guests, Senator Mike Glor, Senator Kate Sullivan, Shadron Superintendent Caroline Winchester, and Lincoln Superintendent Steve Joel. I'm Fred Knapp of NET News. Thanks for joining us.